you. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Can everyone hear me okay? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, and are we are we trying to get done by eight o'clock? Is that the is that the general idea or no? Okay. You can talk as okay. long as you want. Okay. Well, I won't talk. I won't. <laughs> we'll definitely have some questions and discussion uh, okay. uh, a bit later on. It's a little tricky because uh, some of you have read the book and some of you have not. Uh, so I will. What I'll try to do is um, essentially try to introduce the characters, introduce the themes and the subject, uh, but not sort of tell you the whole story uh, for those who, of you who uh, I hope may, uh, may read the book uh, soon. So, you know, it's funny, I looked at the map and looked at North Salem and tried to figure out what the odds are, are that uh, somebody who I'm writing about may have past uh, North, past you guys, or made a stop in North Salem. And it's certainly possible. Uh, most of the people I'm writing about, I think if they could scrape together the fare, took steamboats up the Hudson from New York to Albany. But um, but I would not be surprised if somebody spent a night in your town. Um, you know, I, I'll be happy if at the end of the evening, uh, you guys know a little more about the some of the origins of the Underground Railroad and the remarkable man that I stumbled across, Thomas Smallwood, uh, who really um, made my book work and whose fame I, I uh, hope to spread uh, because he's been almost forgotten. Uh, and I also hope that you learn a little more about the domestic slave trade and also the relationship between the Underground Railroad and the domestic slave trade. So, uh, I'm going to share my screen and show you a bunch of slides. And let's see. It'll take one second. And here's. Okay. And here we go. Let's see. Okay. Um, so here we go. Uh, so let me just shrink my view here a little bit. There we go. Okay. So uh, I hope you can see the slides. If anything goes wrong, um, I hope Carolyn or someone will scream, uh, scream, <laughs> unmute and scream at me. Uh, but anyway, let's see how this goes. Oops. There we go. Okay. So I. Uh, the subtitle is about slavery's borderland. I just want to touch on that for a minute. This is, uh, the story is set in the 1840s. And this is a map from around that time uh, showing helpfully in uh, in red and sort of gray green there, uh, what I mean by the border. Uh, and it's the border between freedom and slavery, of course, basically the Mason-Dixon line in the region that I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, what, what distinguishes it, the one point I'll make about it is that if you were uh, up here where I am in Boston, uh, or perhaps even uh, where you are, you might meet in the 1840s an abolitionist. In Boston, you'd surely meet an abolitionist, but you weren't going to meet a slave trader. If you were in New Orleans, or, you know, Atlanta, or Montgomery, you might well, you probably would meet a slave trader, but you weren't going to meet an abolitionist. And in Baltimore and Washington, the northernmost slaveholding cities, everybody was thrown together. Um, every kind of political view, every view of slavery, every role in the slave society. Uh, and also in those cities, the number of free African Americans was growing fast and they far outnumbered enslaved African-Americans in both Baltimore and Washington. Whereas in the state of Maryland, there were more enslaved people than there were free blacks at that time. But this led to a lot of conflict and a lot of um, ferment, I guess you could say. Uh, and it's really kind of an interesting time. So I'm gonna start with the hero of this book, really the, the, the central character, Thomas Smallwood. I have looked very hard to find a, uh, a photograph of Thomas Smallwood because he lived well into the uh, slavery, uh, sorry, into the uh, 
post-Civil War period. Uh, he didn't die till almost 20 years after the Civil War. So well into the photography era, but I have not yet found a photograph. So I'm gonna substitute his signature. This is actually from a lawsuit he filed in a, in a dispute uh, in Washington, but it's also sort of symbolic because I'm gonna tell you a little bit about him. He was born in slavery in Bladensburg, Maryland. Uh, he bought his freedom by the age of 30 uh, because he was inherited by a woman who married a man who was somewhat hostile to slavery and who was amenable to the idea of giving Thomas his freedom. But for technical legal reasons, he had been inherited by this man, John Ferguson's uh, second wife and her children from an earlier marriage. So he couldn't free him outright and he had to buy him from his uh, wife and her children for $500, which he asked Smallwood to pay back. So uh, when Smallwood was 15, John Ferguson took him to the courthouse in, in uh, Prince George's County, Maryland, which is where I found this document. This, these old documents are still there, it's amazing. Um, and he, he sort of put on the record that in 15 years when you turn 30, I will free you. And uh, that's what he did. He also, he and his wife taught Thomas to read. And Thomas then worked for a man who was a Washington DC educator, who uh, I think gave him a lot to read. And that man's adult children also gave him a lot to read and sort of coached him and helped him along with his self-education. So uh, by the time he was free, he was also very well educated. And he, he and his enslaver both moved to Southeast Washington. So from Bladensburg, it was really about six miles down the Anacostia River, which then was called the Eastern Branch. They moved down the river and they lived very near the wharves. Uh, and here's a picture from 1833. So if you uh, were looking across at Washington and that's uh, that big white building kind of just left of the middle. Down on the water is the Navy Yard. Uh, and Smallwood and John Ferguson, his, his former enslaver, lived just a couple blocks from there. And then up on the hill in the middle of the picture is the United States Capitol without the dome that we would recognize that wasn't added until 1863. And way off to the left is the president's house. <laughs> Um, not yet called the White House, but it was white. And this is just uh, an overhead map from the period. Uh, number one there on the Eastern Branch on the Anacostia River is Smallwood's house. You can see how close he was to the water. His, um, his former enslaver is number three, John Ferguson, and that's the Navy Yard number two. So, Smallwood becomes a shoemaker and he's running a shoe shoemaking business. And he's also beginning to get into, uh, into sort of the politics of the day. And in the black community, uh, one of the big debates that was going on at that time, um, especially among free black people, was colonization. The colonization movement, the colonizationists were encouraging free black people to move elsewhere. And uh, in particular, the American Colonization Society created a uh, new country by the name of Liberia. The capital name, from James, name, name for James Monroe was Monrovia. And this is a, a painting of Monrovia at, the, at that time. And Smallwood initially for a few years was quite enthusiastic about the colonization movement. He had friends who were back and forth to Liberia but at some point, he, uh, like many other African-Americans at the time, kind of came to realize that the powers behind the American Colonization Society were not really looking out for the rights of Black Americans. They were mostly interested in removing free Black people from the country and making it simpler to have uh, Black people enslaved. So he broke with his friends, he broke with the colonization movement. And this is just something from uh, his um, memoir that he 
wrote in 1851. Uh, he said he was grievously deceived. The object and the policy of that society, the American Colonization Society, proved to be under the mask of philanthropy, the draining off the free colored population from among the slave population by inducing them to emigrate to Africa for the doctrine of its leaders was that the free population contaminated the slave population with a spirit of freedom, which made them uneasy in their bonds. So Smallwood was a guy with very strong views. And when he turned on colonization, he really worked against it. He spoke against it. He convinced all his friends to, to break with the movement. Um, and he spent a lot of time uh, in, uh, as I can imagine, overheated meeting rooms uh, talking about uh, the, uh, you know, the, the pros and cons of <clears throat> this movement. Now uh, I'll turn to his sidekick. Uh, when I first came upon Charles Torrey, uh, I found that in the relatively little that's been written about him, there's a very good biography by a distant relative of his published in 2013. But um, generally speaking, he has not gotten a huge amount of attention, but whenever he was written about, if Thomas Smallwood was mentioned, he was sort of presented as Corey's black sidekick. And you know, you don't have to get very far into their stories to realize that it's really the other way around. Uh, so Tory's about a dozen years younger. He's from Massachusetts. Uh, and he's uh, been very active in the anti-slavery movement. For a sec, sorry. Uh, this is his birthplace in Situate, Mass. I'm actually going to give a talk here in Cohasset, Mass. And Situate is the next town. So I added this to my to my slide. To, this is actually, it still exists, the house that he was born in in 1813. Anyway, he uh, had a very different, as you can kind of imagine looking at this picture at, at this house, he, he had a tragic early life. His parents both died of tuberculosis. His sister died of tuberculosis, but he was raised by his grandparents and his grandfather had served in Congress and was, you know, was a very well-known um, public figure. Uh, so they weren't extremely wealthy, um, but they were well off. And uh, so the contrast with Thomas Smallwood's uh, early life is, is quite uh, sharp. Uh, instead of being born into slavery, Tory was born into, you know, you could say the elite. And he attended Exeter and Yale. He graduated from Yale. And uh, after Yale, so so um, Smallwood, while Smallwood was educating himself uh, as best he could, um, Charles Tory was going to Yale. And uh, he was a very religious guy shaped by the Second Great Awakening, as it was called. And uh, he, after he graduated, he decided to try his hand at school teaching. However, uh, you know, his diaries survive. And uh, so you, you kind of can follow him blow by blow through his early and later life, uh, quite a bit of it anyway. Um, but this teaching did not go very well. He talks about having five students at the start and he gets up to 20, but then he gets back down to five. Apparently it wasn't um, a great hit. As far as temporal matters are concerned, one of disappointment and almost pecuniary embarrassment for at this moment, I have not one cent on hand. The number of pupils, small, considerable debts. I hardly know what prospects as the future. So he's only 20 years old but he's already sort of flamed out as a teacher. It's hard to tell whether he quit or was fired, but basically his, his pupils were dwindling away. So he then decided to try his hand at preaching. And he um, didn't do any better at preaching, it's fair to say, than he did at teaching. Uh, I found one of his parishioners, he, he preached at a couple different churches in New England. And in one of them, I found someone who said he gave a terrible sermon. And so, however, one of the things that was sort of distracting him from his preaching career was he had discovered the anti-slavery movement. We're talking about the 1830s. And 
the abolitionist movement really took off in the 1830s. Many small towns in the North, as you probably know, uh, created abolition societies at that time. And um, people were really getting outspoken uh, about the evils of slavery, meeting, sending money, trying to uh, organize. And Tory got very involved in that. Um, when he got involved, uh, I guess you could say both Smallwood and Tory um, were men of strong convictions and strong opinions. And Tory, this is just a passage from a letter to a close friend and mentor of Tory's attacking the famous, the most famous abolitionist of the country, William Lloyd Garrison. This is an 1839 letter in which he refers to the Liberator, which was Garrison's famous abolitionist newspaper as the lying berator, um, because Garrison was attacking him and attacking Tory and his allies, and uh, they were attacking Garrison. And they had a big showdown in the same year, 1839, and Tory and his allies tried to overthrow Garrison in the Massachusetts anti-slavery um, society, but Garrison kind of rallied his troops and um, fended them off and they started uh, a new newspaper and a different society. Uh, and for a while, Tory was on the road, uh, sort of giving uh, on the lecture circuit, giving lectures against slavery, having left behind uh, teaching and preaching. This, okay, now um, uh, let me go back here just for a second. So what happens at this point is uh, Tory decides to try yet another career. Um, though without giving up uh, his his focus on uh, on abolitionism on this anti-slavery movement, he goes to uh, a bunch of small abolitionist papers in the north, and he says, "I'll be your Washington correspondent. I'll cover Congress and the White House for you, and send dispatches back." So I think about twenty of these papers agree to uh, basically sponsor his um, job as a Washington correspondent. And he moves to Washington. He's never been in slave country before. Washington, of course, is a slave city. The slave trade is, is um, carried out on the National Mall. Um, so he's, I think, both excited to be in the midst of the enemy in a way uh, that he had been talking about for years, and uh, to be, you know, sort of facing facing slavery and witnessing slavery in a way that he never had before. This is uh, a closer view of the US Capitol right about that time, just a few years later. Um, so this is uh, not far from where Smallwood lived and where Tory lived. Um, and I should say that Washington City had 23,000 people at the time. It was really sort of an oversized village plus the federal government. And um, Charles Dickens, who plays a role in my book, uh, he passed through in 1842 and was really sort of, um, he found Washington breathtakingly unimpressive. He was coming from a city uh, of, of 2 million, London had 2 million people, and coming to this capital, supposed capital of 23,000, he found quite amusing. Um, Tory gets on to his first story very uh, soon after moving to Washington at the end of uh, 1841. And he comes across the fact that slaveholders are going to be meeting in Annapolis, uh, the capital of Maryland. And so he decides he's going to go there, hang out, talk to the slaveholders, witness what they say to each other. And, and uh, this will be great stuff for his, uh, his clients, his, his newspaper clients. However, they see, they, they're kind of warned that this anti-slavery uh, guy, activist, journalist is there, is in town. They realize he's he's in he's present. He's asked to leave. Instead of leaving, he goes up in the balcony. Anyway, um, pretty soon they throw him out and a mob gathers. Maryland is a slave state. Um, what the abolitionists called the slave power was very much uh, in control of the state. And a mob quickly gathers and is basically talking about whether to lynch Tory or tar and feather him or what. And a magistrate decides to lock him up in jail for his own safety. And 
in jail, it turns out to be a very um, memorable uh, few days for Tory. He meets two black families who have been jailed there because their fate is being decided by the court. They're, um, they are property, human property, caught up in an estate dispute. And the likelihood is that both families are gonna be sold south, sold to the deep south. And he is so moved by um, these people and their story and their plight that he makes a pledge in the Annapolis jail. And Tory's 28 years old now. And so he's a young guy, he's full of himself and full of fire and brimstone. And he vows and he writes into these newspapers that he's vowing that he will not cease to talk, write, preach, pray, and vote against slavery till there is no slaveholder in any church or any slave in our land. Uh, so that's kind of uh, a grand pledge to be making for this guy who's still basically a nobody, um, but he has a lot of enthusiasm. And uh, and it's at a time when Smallwood has, um, you know, battled the colonizationists and is determined to um, make his own war on slavery and is trying to figure out how to do it. So this is a kind of momentous meeting in this story. Um, Smallwood reads in the local papers about this crazy white man who's gone to the slaveholders convention in Annapolis and uh, gotten himself arrested. And he's intrigued and he's particularly intrigued because he's heard from his wife that this guy, Charles Torrey is living in Mrs. Paget's boarding house. <clears throat> and um, Elizabeth Smallwood, Smallwood's wife does the laundry for Paget's boarding house. So she knows Torrey, you know, uh, and, Smallwood asks her to arrange a meeting. Now these boarding houses are kind of interesting institutions at the time. Um, a lot of people live in them who have various official jobs in Washington, including many members of Congress. And some of them get reputations, sort of political reputations. So another one, Mrs. Spriggs, which um, turns up in my story, was famous as the abolition boarding house. It had a bunch of radical abolitionists in it. Um, and uh, so this was where a lot of um, sort of informal uh, negotiations related to Congress and to the government took place in these boarding houses. And uh, so Mrs. Smallwood introduces, Elizabeth Smallwood introduces Thomas Smallwood to Charles Tory. And it's, you know, neither of them left any kind of detailed account of this meeting, but it's fun to try to imagine what happened. Um, the way I think of it is these are two guys who have been, um, who've done a lot of talking about uh, slavery, but have not done much about it. And, uh, you know, I think Smallwood was a little tired of talking about arguing about colonization. Tory was probably a little tired about arguing about abolition strategy with Garrison and his allies. And they uh, come up with a, um, a pretty outrageous plan, which is to help people to escape slavery, not in ones and twos, but by the wagon load. And uh, at least to start with, Smallwood is recruiting, you've got to recruit people to flee north, not wait for people to come to him, but go to them and say, how would you like to run for it. And they begin to work on this project. Now, um, this is outside the scope of the book, um, but I just, I, I had to share it with you because it the, the runaway ads, the ads for people who run from slavery in this period, uh, which play a big role in this story, uh, have a kind of paradox in many of them. And this is just, this is the clearest example I've come across. It's from 1809. And this is outside Baltimore in Carroll County, Maryland. And they're advertising for a man who's run off, whose name is Peter. And the, the enslaver, David Shriver says, Peter speaks German as well as English. He says he can do all the work necessary on a plantation. Plus he can do a little of blacksmithing, shoemaking, carpenter's work. He has some knowledge of making gun barrels. Oh, and he also plays the fiddle and five tolerably well. 
You read that and you say, why in the world would Peter want to go back into slavery? Um, so it's it's kind of remarkable, the um, the descriptions that the enslavers run. Now, what starts to happen in the in, in 1842 is you start to see ads placed for um, people who've fled local slaveholders in Washington and Baltimore. And um, they are people who Tory and Smallwood have helped to escape. And here's just a closer look with $150 reward offered for Henry Chase and Frank Douglas, my two servants. And, um, you know, they don't know it, but for the most part, these guys were heading for Canada. And in many cases, by the time these ads had run for a day or two, they were in Canada. And uh, here's $400 reward, which is a lot of money. That, <clears throat> that was um, about 12, uh, let's see, $12,000. Um, so there, there, and this was for, um, this was if they were found at a distance and uh, in in Pennsylvania or New York in a free state, and he would pay less if they were local. Now, <clears throat> at the same time, of, um, the toxin of liberty, toxin is an old word for bell, so this basically means liberty bell. This was a little abolitionist paper in Albany, New York. And these guys um, begin to develop a relationship with Toxin of Liberty. It was one of the papers that Tory was going to write for. He quick, pretty quickly sort of set aside his journalistic duties because he was helping Smallwood with these escapes. Um, but what happens is Smallwood begins to write letters to Toxin of Liberty in which he um, he is uh, they're essentially satirical letters about the escapes, uh, in which he writes under a pseudonym, and their purpose is basically to mock the slaveholders and to celebrate those escaping from them. And he borrows a, a, a pseudonym from Charles Dickens' Pickwick Papers, and he's off to the races. And this is just to give you a little sample of the style. I Sam Samuel Weller Jr who's this character from the Pickwick Papers, will continue to scoff at, annoy, and expose the slaveholders in their crooked ways to their perfect mystification and great pain during weeks and months to come, the poor ignoramuses to think, to catch such a weasel as I, asleep. Now, uh, he uses the real names of the slaveholders, the real names of the people are running from them. And as far as I can tell, these are the only real-time accounts of escapes that were published um, during the uh, period of slavery and the Underground Railroad. And speaking of the Underground Railroad, uh, I stumbled across, I basically found these papers in the Boston, in a, a warehouse of the Boston Public Library. And I taught, it was the middle of COVID, it was the height of the pandemic, and it took me months, but eventually I talked them into digging them out of this warehouse. And uh, eventually I got a call from somebody saying, we microfilmed the whole collection. So I went to the Boston Public Library, which had reopened uh, um, on a kind of limited basis. And I was able to download images of all the microfilmed uh, copies of this paper. And when I was reading along through his letters, through, uh, through Thomas Smallwood's letters to this paper, I stumbled across him beginning to use the term Underground Railroad. And gradually, I won't tell you the whole story, but basically it became clear that he had, he was responsible for naming uh, the Underground Railroad. And uh, no one had realized that, you know, scholars really did not know where that term came from. And it turns out it came very much from Thomas Smallwood. And he, he just had a grand time with it because he'd gotten it from a constable a, a slave catching police constable in Baltimore who was overheard um, cursing about how lots of people were escaping slavery and he didn't know how they were getting away and he didn't know where they were. And he said they must be getting away by underground railroad or steam balloon, which was uh, basically saying, I have no idea how they're getting away. It's impossible. 
the way we might say they must be uh they must have been kidnapped by aliens and so smallwood hears this and includes it in one of his letters and then he kind of runs with it he just thinks it's a great idea it's sort of a compliment to him because these people can't figure out how the slaves are getting away and so he starts riffing on this theme of an underground railroad which of course is a mythical transport system but he appoints himself general agent as you see here of all the branches of the national underground railroad steam packet canal and foot it company business begins to be very brisk i've sent off no less than nine passengers from the city within a week etc um and pretty soon these letters became a a, a really popular feature of the toxin of liberty newspaper and by now at the, uh, late in late um 1842 charles tory leaves smallwood in washington so smallwood is operating the uh, organizing the escapes on his own and goes up and becomes the editor of toxin of liberty and this is what we used to call i you know i spent 40 years in the in newspaper business and we used to call this a house ad you know where you had a hole in the newspaper you would fill it with a house ad an ad for the baltimore sun and an ad for the new york times and this is an ad for Toxin of Liberty. But it, what's striking about it is I, you know, this is quoting an, an old man uh, saying that he had to give up tobacco to afford to subscribe to the paper. So he would because he was so deeply interested with Samuel Weller Jr.'s letters respecting the Underground Railroad. So they really became a, um, a popular feature. Now, there's a bad guy in this story, as those of you who've read it know. And the bad guy is the leading slave trader of this era. His name was Hope Slatter, a somewhat ironic name. He was named actually for a famous Methodist preacher. Uh, he was born in Georgia. He became a sheriff. Being a sheriff allows you to um, expose you in those days to the business of the purchase and sale of the enslaved because as sheriff, you're overseeing estate sales and that kind of thing. Um, and he eventually, he worked in several Southern cities, kind of learned the trade. And then in 18, mid 1830s began operating from Baltimore. Baltimore is the, the largest city in the slave South and the most Northern city in the slave South. And at this time, we're talking about the first half of the 19th century, tobacco has kind of worn out the soil in Virginia, Maryland, in that region. And many farmers are switching over to grains, which is much less labor intensive. And they find themselves with a surplus of enslaved workers. And at the same time, the cotton gin has been invented and folks are just, um, uh, the, the planters in the deep South are desperate for more workers. They can basically sell all the cotton they can grow it's America's largest ex export crop. And uh, so they're desperate for laborers. And so this class of slave traders, domestic slave traders, arises around 1810, 1815. And Hope Slatter joins that group and becomes one of the dominant figures in the 1830s and 40s. And uh, what's happened is Congress has banned the international slave trade uh, effective in 1808. And so the um, enslavers can no longer import Africans and they have to find their labor sources inside the United States. And that really uh, drives the prices of people in the upper South, in the Chesapeake region higher, um, but not as high as you could get in the deep South. So guys like Hope Slatter made a fortune, um, uh, you know, leveraging that difference in price. To prove, you know, one of the helpful record keeping um, requirements of the federal government was that they had to have a manifest of everybody aboard, uh, every enslaved person shipped south aboard one of these ships, in part because they wanted to make sure people weren't cheating and breaking the law and importing people from Africa. So it means there's a record of everyone who went south and they had to use first and last names, even though the slaveholders often like to pretend that the enslaved had no last names. 
Um, and uh, so this has become a very helpful record. And you see his signature there, Hope H. Slatter, Baltimore. Slatter ran ads every day in the Baltimore Sun and in uh, around the state in smaller papers in slaveholding areas. And uh, this is called Cash for Negroes. That was almost all of the header. And this one is early on in 1838. And he's bragging about the building that he has built just north. If any of you have been to the Baltimore's Inner Harbor, this is about two blocks from the Inner Harbor. And he had built a slave jail, a private slave jail, to accumulate people who then, when he had a shipload, he would ship south. And it had, it basically was a brick jail with barred cells for men and women separately and a courtyard in the middle. But the way he describes it, uh, it has been erected under his own in, uh, inspection without regard to price, planned and arranged upon the most approved principle with an eye to comfort and convenience, not surpassed by any establishment of the kind in the United States. It sounds like he's opening a hotel but then he says, it is now ready to receive slaves. And down at the bottom, cash and the highest prices will at all times be given for likely slaves of both sexes. So he begins to make a fortune buying people for $500, $600, $700 in Maryland and selling them for $800,000, $900,000 in New Orleans. He almost always was shipping them about three weeks um, to New Orleans, he had a brother who operated his uh, showroom, believe it or not, they called it the showroom um, for the enslaved in New Orleans. And the tragedy of the slave trade was that these guys separated families routinely. So wives would be sold away from husbands, children away from parents, and uh, you know, it meant that for decades after the Civil War, Black families were running classified ads around the country looking for their lost relatives. You know, help me find my mother. They're really heartbreaking ads. Oops. Okay, hang on. Okay. Um, so this is just, this doesn't mean much, but the basin is the name of the Inner Harbor at the time. And number one is Slatter's Slave Jail, a ways away. And this is a picture of Baltimore's Harbor from 1845. Um, amazing, there was a guy, a photographer who, an early photographer, whose work is preserved uh, in what was the Maryland Historical Society collection. And so it really does give you a feeling for what it, what it was like. And here's a street scene also from 1845. And this is actually Hope Slatter's slave jail on Pratt Street, the street that runs along the Inner Harbor. This was taken in 1910. It was it was uh, torn down after that, so it no longer exists. And it was obviously out of use for decades before this picture was taken, but it gives you a little bit of an idea of what it was like. This is from an anti-slavery book, uh, a picture of a man, the guy holding his hat in the middle of the frame. Um, <clears throat> he's being separated from his baby and his wife and presumably there, there are his other kids. The, the slaveholder who's selling him uh, evidently is the woman on the right in the bonnet and the slaveholder looking both sort of dapper and evil is the guy in the top hat on the right. So this is anti-slavery propaganda, but this is very much uh, a true story. And again, this is another anti-slavery poster. This one is specifically focused on the slave trade in the nation's capital and um, which many abolitionists focused on because, you know, they thought if they could get rid of slavery in DC, it, it would be a step um, towards abolition in general. And it was all, they also, you know, pointed out that for a country, as Dickens said, um, that talked a lot about freedom, it was remarkable to see people being sold, bought and sold um, at numerous locations in, in Washington. So there you have uh, what appears to be a family on the right uh, 
that's losing some relatives, perhaps a father, perhaps brothers, uh, they're being rowed out to the ship that's going to carry them off. Uh, you see people working in the field and somebody's got a lash up in the distance on the right and there's the US Capitol. Um, so it's a propaganda poster, but it very much reflects the reality of the day. Um, I will just linger on this for a moment, but this was a, this is also outside the book, but it just, this has stuck with me ever since I discovered it 20 years ago. Um, it is a, um, a broadside, a poster that was posted to raise money to buy the freedom of Eliza Rogers, an 18 year old in Baltimore, who had been, uh, what happened was if your enslaver decides to sell you this, you know, Hope Slatter's boys would go out and find you wherever you were, clap you in irons and you would disappear. And sometimes um, it was very common in the city to hire out an enslaved worker to somebody else. So this woman had actually worked for some years in a different family who was not her owner of record, but the owner needed money. So the owner just says, I want to sell her. And she disappears from this family. And it turns out the mother of this 18 year old has already lost another daughter to the slave trade. Uh, four years earlier has not seen her since. So her father, this 18 year old father is free and he offers to indenture himself to raise the $850 to buy her freedom. But that is turned down by the slave trader. And so they're kind of desperately looking for um, you know, uh, do-gooders, donors, uh, it's called an appeal to the benevolent. They're looking for people to donate the $850 before she's put on a ship and, and shipped away to New Orleans, never to be seen again. And you, you, you know, when you think about it, you realize that um, she would literally be disappearing as far as her family is concerned. There was no way to know where she ended up and uh, she would probably be in circumstances where it'd be very difficult for her to write to them. And, you know, people literally just disappeared from their families. So one of the things that I discovered writing this book that was, you know, sort of a, a very useful um, observation to the story was that the Underground Railroad road was driven in many ways by the domestic slave trade, because everyone in the Upper South, particularly in Maryland, Virginia, had to live every day with the fear that they would be sold South. Um, potentially with no warning, they would be just disappeared from their families, separated forever. And so this is interviews with two guys. Uh, 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 somebody went to Canada in the 1850s and interviewed people who had fled slavery to Canada, all the way to Canada. Small would always encourage people to keep running till you got to Canada. And, uh, you know, they both said, and there are lots of others like this, the fear of being sold South had more influence inducing me to leave than any other thing. Master used to say that if we didn't suit him, <clears throat> he would put us in his pocket quick, meaning he would sell us. That was literally the language used. I'll put you in my pocket. And George Ross says, I came away because I was standing in fear of being separated from my wife and children. So Smallwood also observed this. I frequently had lots of slaves concealed about in Washington who had fled to me for safety when they got wind that their masters were about to sell them to the slave traders. So he observed this as well. And so basically the, the sort of big picture shape of the book and this, this map of is sort of a frontispiece in the front of the book, <clears throat> is the existential dilemma of the enslaved in the borderland. Uh, because they knew that at any time they could be sold south, but they also knew they were close enough to Pennsylvania, to a free state, that they had a chance uh, of making it. it. wouldn't be easy, but they had a chance of making it uh, into the north and into freedom. And uh, so that is... You know, you can see those two routes on the map, and that is basically the framework for this book.
So I'm going to end my screen sharing now and hopefully we can kick this around a little bit. I'd, I'd love to hear questions, comments, anything you got. And you can, yeah, everybody, as far as I'm concerned, everyone can unmute themselves, but certainly remember to unmute yourself if you wanna ask a question. You can either you can speak up if you want. I think we have a small enough group. Um, okay, I've got I've got a couple for you. I'm going to ask uh, Elaine's question first, and then I've, I've got a question of my own. Um, one of the members of our discussion on Tuesday had raised the thought it's an interesting question, and in that you really spent what seemed like pretty equal time with Smallwood and with Tory, mm -hmm. and yet your title of the book referred to a hero in the singular. Mm. And um, you were wondering if that was a judgment about Tory or just that you sort of began the book with the focus on Smallwood and and sort of saw him more as the hero, because yeah. as a group, we sort of saw Tory as pretty heroic as well. Yes. Mm. Uh, no, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Mm. Um, there's a number of things going on there. One is that I kind of realized in reading about these guys and in thinking about their situation that Smallwood, who was um, significantly older and was local and was black, would have been the key guy in organizing these escapes. If you think about trying to, they were, they were trying to round up 10, 12, 15, 18 people, a wagon load of men, women, and children. And they, were, they would usually come from multiple households and you're trying to do this completely surreptitiously. Smallwood is able to approach uh, black people enslaved or free and converse with them without raising any suspicions. Um, he's a, you know, he's got a business. He can talk to them about making a pair of shoes. He can talk to them. He can see them at the market. He can see them anywhere. Tory was much more circumscribed. I think Tory had an important role in setting up this system. He had more contacts to the North. He had um, much greater ability to fundraise, um, but he um, he also um, does this for about six months and then disappears to the North, where he's very much um, you know cheerleading and certainly in some instances assisting people as they pass through Albany on the way North. But he's become an uh, an editor in Albany. As you know from the book, he he returns south uh, later for a bit, but um, but I think I see Smallwood's role is more central. The other thing is Smallwood's letters to the paper are really extraordinary. Um, I reached out to Henry Louis Gates of Harvard to see if he would read the book and say something nice about it, which he eventually did. But he got surprisingly excited about it. And, and the reason it turned out, I really had no idea why. Um, but I am going to edit a book of Smallwood's writings for Gates' um, Penguin Classic series of African-American writers. And, uh, you know, his um, Smallwood's writings are, are, are really, are, I think, are unique and are really kind of an extraordinary uh, satirical collection um that is like nothing else so um so and the other thing is is tory has gotten some attention he's got a biography written about him smallwood is basically forgotten and that's that's where that subtitle comes from what's your other uh question uh my other question is i just wondered what your take was um having gotten so deep into this on frederick Douglass's um really hostile uh response to what Smallwood and Tory were doing. Well, um, are you talking about the criticism of writing about the escapes? Well, it seemed uh, in the one excerpt you included where you quoted Douglas. Yeah. Well, I, he wasn't, uh, yeah. I mean, Douglas does not appear, he talks about the West, so he's probably talking about Ohio, but he complains that people are bragging about the Underground Railroad, writing about the Underground Railroad, and he basically says that's very poor uh, operational security. And, you know, this is a clandestine operation. You really shouldn't be talking about it. And, you know, he's not wrong. Uh, um, these were secret operations. And even though Smallwood was writing under a um, pseudonym, it was also true that 
you know, um, he his letters undoubtedly caused the slaveholders and slave catchers to focus very hard on who is this guy who's writing these letters, who knows what's going on, who knows, you know, who uh, who's uh, whose workers have run off last week and, you know, who's kind of doing this blow by blow real time account. So I'm sure it, um, you know, you could certainly criticize it as unwise. Um, Frederick Douglass is, he's sort of, you know, uh, he's not a direct part of the story, but, you know, S Smallwood was helping a lot of people escape from Baltimore and through Baltimore, uh, which of course is just, uh, you know, at the time it was one night's um, travel uh, from Washington to reach Baltimore. But he had a, a um, an ally named Jacob Gibbs, who was a local house painter, who became his sort of ally in Baltimore. And so they were recruiting a lot of people to run from Baltimore. So Frederick Douglass, and this was in the early 1840s, 1842, 1843. Uh, and Douglass had fled Baltimore in 1838, just a few years earlier and had, um, you know, at this time was sort of getting on his feet. He had linked up with Garrison, Tory's uh, enemy, and, and was beginning to go on the lecture circuit in the North. And he wrote his first autobiography in published in 1845. So it was ranked during this period. Other questions? Let's see, is there a question in the chat? Let's just see. Uh, Oh, sounds, uh, yes, let's see. Gail says uh, the fight over slavery sounds much like today's fight over gun control hindered by the support given by the NRA. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a it was a national debate with, you know, very passionate voices on both sides. Um, and the stakes were very high as they are today o over guns. Um, I think one of the things that I learned in researching the book that I hadn't fully realized is that at the turn of the century, the 18, around 1800 and before that, you can find a significant number of slaveholders who, who defend slavery, but as a necessary evil. <clears throat> but by the 1830s, as the abolitionists begin to um, attack the slave system and the slaveholders, they, their argument shifts and, and they, there are many voices that begin to argue not that slavery is a necessary evil, but it is the ideal, it's the ideal arrangement of society. And uh, I mean, it's really remarkable. You can find uh, slaveholders in Congress arguing that this is uh, the way everyone should organize a society. There should be a class at the bottom of enslaved people who support the rest of us. And things got extremely polarized during this period, um, which is something that we we absolutely know a lot about. Um, and one other point I'll make is the enslavers by, you know, when they defended slavery, their argument that this was I, the ideal arrangement of uh, organization of society was based on the idea that these Africans and their descendants were incapable of caring for themselves. Uh, so therefore the slaveholders were doing them a big favor, a big service by providing them housing, food, work. And, um, you know, when Smallwood writes these letters, he, uh, he totally turns that uh, topsy-turvy. And he basically portrays the slaveholders as a sort of, dim-witted race of people who are not capable of caring for themselves. They can't get their own meals. They can't uh, address themselves. They can't drive the way their carriages. Um, they're pretty, pretty um, hapless. And he portrays the enslaved as clever, witty, much smarter than the slaveholders and smart enough to get away. So, you know, he kind of turns the entire um, argument of the slaveholders upside down, which I'm sure infuriated those who um, who read these letters. And I should say that when Smallwood named a slaveholder in one of his columns, he asked the editors in Albany to make sure they sent a copy of that paper to the slaveholders. 
And uh, therefore, um, he wanted to make sure that uh, they got to read what he had to say about them. Um, I have a question, yes. Scott. Yes. Um, so why could you talk a little bit about the fact that there were more free blacks in urban areas, <clears throat> excuse me, in Baltimore than there were elsewhere? Yeah. That's one question. And then the other, a couple other questions too. One is that there is a, there was a large Quaker community in Sandy Spring and um, did they help Smallwood, you know? You know, one of the great frustrations of writing about the Underground Railroad is that um, it's a clandestine, it's, you know, I spent years writing about the CIA and there are some similarities. Um, it, it's, uh, it's an operation that was meant to be secret and that in some cases to preserve the freedom and even the lives of the participants, it had to be kept secret. So I've been in Sandy Spring, I, I, I've, um, you know, I've, I've read about the Quakers in that community and they were definitely helping people on the way north. Um, I don't know that they played a role in this. Smallwood in one of, in, in probably his most um, detailed description of what they were up to said that generally speaking, they tried to operate by by the wagon, you know, by horse horse drawn wagon. And they tried to make it 37 miles the first night, uh, which would roughly place them in Baltimore. So they probably went right past Sandy Spring, which is right. north of Washington, uh, right. but not nearly as far, far as Baltimore. Um, and the question about free blacks in the cities, I mean, in the early years of the 19th century, and in late years even of the 18th century, the um, tobacco apparently really wears out the soil. So as, to as tobacco crops declined, um, the you know there was this uh, um, surplus of labor, and before the cotton uh, the cotton plantations really took off, before the cotton gin was in in widespread use. Uh, there was a period there where manumissions, in other words, formal releases signed by a slave owner and you know filed at the courthouse, manumissions became extremely common. And so a lot of people were being freed. Then what happens is there's suddenly a market for these people. I mean, you know, the, the Maryland farmers were not freeing people because uh, they had big hearts. They basically didn't want the responsibility of housing and freeing people who they didn't need to work on their farm or plantation. So it was basically an economic decision for them. But that decision changed uh, very quickly as the market changed and as the cotton and sugarcane uh, uh, plantation <laughs> and the demand for workers in the deep south drove the prices higher. So a lot of people had been freed in, in the late 19th century, uh, the, sorry, the uh, late 18th century, early 19th century. And it was very common, you know, for people who there was, you know, there were black communities in rural areas, but, you know, basically if you, if you were freed from a plantation on the Eastern shore, if you're freed from a plantation in Northern Baltimore County or in, in uh, Southern Maryland, um, you know, it was very common as it has been basically through history to make your way to the city, which had greater freedom um, and more, you know, economic opportunities. So, um, you know, it's very interesting though, the, the churches, the black churches in Baltimore and, and DC at the time, the congregations were, con you know, uh, were composed of free and, and enslaved people. And that was one of the reasons Smallwood could operate. He knew all these people from, from church and, uh, he, you know, the, they were his neighbors, the whites and the blacks, and uh, and so he was in a in a very good position to kind of know who was who and and uh, and you know how they should be approached. Other questions? Let's see. Uh, I'm just looking in the chat here. Uh, well, I, so, I have a question. I have a question. I have a, mm -hmm. I have a question. Okay. Uh, I have actually two questions. One, I, you focus a lot on Baltimore, and yeah. I think it's fair to say that, you know, Baltimore 
is a fairly troubled city and a lot has been said about crime, about racism, about corruption in the police, et cetera. Were yeah. you hoping um, in writing this that obviously that you would enlighten people, but also make them sort of consider things somewhat out of the box or to look back at a, at a very, very difficult history and say, you know, rather than, well, you know, the men always leave these families to look at it in a different context, i.e. you're spending a good amount of time or you, you point out that families were broken up. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you see is that people didn't even have a surname. I mean, mm -hmm. for them to even trace them each, yeah. you know, it must have been incredibly difficult. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, that's a very interesting question. It's something I've thought about a lot, obviously. Um, I think it's very difficult to draw a direct line right. from things that were happening in the 1840s um, in slavery to the present day. But, you know, I think only as an adult did I learn, you know, I think I had as a kid the idea that there was slavery and then Lincoln freed the slaves. Mm -hmm. And then uh, somewhere along there, there was the civil rights movement. And then we live, we all lived happily ever after. Right. And, um, you know, I, I had no idea about reconstruction and what the Southerners called redemption, the end of reconstruction, the reassertion of white supremacy. There's a great book called Slavery by Another Name um, that you might be interested in about the peonage system. And, you know, so essentially what happened was uh, slavery was replaced by systems in the South by the 1870s that were closely resembled slavery. And that was eventually followed, of course, by um, decades of lynching, supporting the Jim Crow mm -hmm. regime. And, you know, in a city like Baltimore, um, redlining and uh, actually Carolyn, who, who once lived mm -hmm. in Baltimore, and I were talking about this earlier, they're, they're literally in the deeds to houses in the land records um restrictions saying black mm -hmm. people cannot buy this house so um you know i think it's the whole weight of slavery and everything that followed that produces the kind of inequities that you see in a place like baltimore um but um but it's it is definitely something i've i've thought about a great deal even though i'm i'm loath to try to you know make a direct connection Right. between uh you know families that were broken up by the slave trade and families that were broken up in in current times when a lot of you know if you look at the stats an awful lot of white children are growing up uh without two parents as well but i have one other question which is yeah. since you've written a book um and he is an unknown in history till you small would illuminate him uh, have you had any teachers, it's uh, professors, et cetera, come to you and say that they're really interested in making this part of their curriculum? A little bit. Um, I hope I hope there will be more. Um, I would love to see um, a lot of sort of public education around Smallwood because I think he he's an extraordinary figure. He may, you know, he's in a way got elements of Frederick Douglass and elements of Harriet Tubman. Um, but uh, I, I expect that he will gradually become significantly better known um, now that it's been demonstrated that he came up with the name of the Underground Railroad. And once these letters are sort of um, out there and, and get more attention, um, I'm definitely gonna be doing some speaking. I've done a little, I'm gonna do some more speaking at universities and high schools. And I would love to, you know, for, for a long time, for months, I was thinking I really want to work for a statue of Smallwood in Washington, DC. And then I realized, wait a minute, I haven't found a picture of the guy. <laughs> so, uh, maybe we can have an abstract- I was um, gonna say, there you abstract go. abstract sculpture uh, of, of Smallwood. Um, I'd also like to see, Baltimore is thinking real hard about redoing its inner harbor now. Um, it was a huge tourist draw starting in the 80s mm -hmm. and it's, you know, it's still a pleasant place, but it's sort of lost its its freshness. And so there's um, a big project afoot to kind of do a lot of rebuilding and redesigning down there. And I wrote to the developer who's in charge of it the other day. 
uh, and said, you really ought to put a monument to the victims of the domestic slave trade um, down there and work it in there with a kind of you know series of panels or something to educate people about the domestic slave trade. Now, I'm sure that's the last thing this guy <laughs> wants to hear. And I'm sure it's the last thing the mayor wants to hear. Um, but you know, anyone who's been to Berlin and has seen the Holocaust Memorial there, for example, uh, which has this very striking um, you, you know, set of sort of stone boxes above ground and then a kind right. of display below ground. I mean, I, I'm imagining a, a smaller version of that. And it happens that the place where, as far as I can tell, Smallwood Slave Jail was is, uh, is a vacant lot now. So it's the perfect location. You mean sla Slatter's Slatter. Slatter. Slatter Slave Jail. Sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> Yeah, I have a question. Uh, I know Smallwood did lose five of his children, but a few of them did make it into adulthood. Have you found any kind of history on his descendants? I have been working on that, and I kind of ran out of time. Um, you know, I put a lot of time into it and couldn't find anyone, although I, I suspect there may be some living descendants. And I got to get back to it. It's just that I had to... Uh, I had a fairly short deadline for the book, and so I had to, I had to turn back to that. And, and at some point, I also realized, I think we're talking about roughly seven generations. And I thought that if someone came to me and said, "Hey, you know, I discovered your ancestor from seven generations ago," I would say, "Well, great, tell me about it." In other words, at first, I was kind of thinking the descendants would have some information for me, but eventually, I, I kind of realized that was probably unrealistic. And um, I would probably have information for them, but I'm I'm definitely going to follow that chain to the end and and uh, see if I can't um, find some of those folks. Thank you. Sure. Is your next project going to be on the same subject, or do you well, have a next project? <laughs> my immediate next project is this book of Smallwood's writings. writings right. um, I I think it's possible that I've missed a couple of his letters. To the Albany paper um, because there are some missing issues that I haven't been able to track down. The Boston Public Library had a pretty complete collection, but it's not entire, entirely complete. So I want to make sure I have the right ones. I have to write an essay and uh, you know do some explanatory footnotes and that kind of thing. I don't know if anyone's looked at the appendix where I put some of the letters in the back of the book, but they're they're sort of an acquired skill to read them. They're very elusive. Uh, they drop a lot of names and and you kind of feel like you're dropped in the middle of this bewildering story. So I think I need some kind of introductory stuff and some footnotes to help people understand that. Um, but I'll be working on that for a while and then and then who knows i've I've got various book ideas that I have thought about for many years, um, uh, often things I wrote about as a journalist, uh, but none that has, I'm sort of ready to plunge into. And you've given up Russia and all of that? Oh, I would love to uh, write a book with a Russian angle. Unfortunately, since the since Putin invaded Ukraine, um, I mean, I was last in Russia in 2019, and it would probably not be a great idea for me to go back. Um, because I've written some pretty unkind <laughs> things about Putin, and uh, and you know you saw what happened to that Wall Street Journal reporter who's still locked up. Um, so you know I stay in touch with friends there, um, and uh, you know, but I would love to write something about that. Another subject uh, I, I seem to find all the happy ones, but torture. I wrote a lot about the CIA's use of torture in the years after 9/11 and. And there's a lot of interesting historical angles and political angles to that one. I might return to that someday. Um, let me just check the chat again. I'm a descendant of abolitionists in Ohio, used their home for Underground Railroad. Um, let's see. Uh, given the proximity of uh, Ocean Voyage for Baltimore, um, can I assume the upper north fear of disappearing would be more acute than the al along the shore versus the interior like Ohio? 
Um, that's a great question. And I really haven't researched, I mean, the other sort of famous border in the uh, for the Underground Railroad and for the border between slavery and freedom is basically the Ohio River um, between, you know, Ohio, Cincinnati and Kentucky. And there was a lot of uh, activity across that border as well. I mean, I suppose if you were sold south, I mean, generally the, the other way, other than being shipped the way Hope Slatter did it, um, probably a majority of cases, people were chained together. The men were chained together in what they called a coffel, C-O-F-F-L-E, um, which would be a string of 20 or 30 or 50 or 80 people um, in irons. And usually women and children would be not chained, but would follow behind. And there was usually a one of the um, slave traders' men on a horse in front and a horse behind with a with a gun. Um, and they would literally march them hundreds of miles uh, to the south. And so that was probably the way people were um, being shipped, for example, from Kentucky down to Louisiana or Mississippi or Alabama. Um, and, you know, uh, yeah, I'm not sure the fear would have been that much less. And once you're in the hands of the slave trader, um, you are pretty much out of luck. So it's true that you might have a slightly better chance of escaping uh, from a coffel than from a ship. But um, but you, you were really, in most cases, um, doomed to uh, a new life, often away from your family, torn from your family in, in a totally different place. Scott, since since we've got you here, is, can I ask you for a quick uh, um, word on what you found out about the Russian involvement in the 2016 election? <laughs> I don't know. If, I know that's like a big one to open that's up, a, but that's like you just to have a guy who really has done some work on that. I'm really curious. What that's another very brief um, way. Uh, that's another story, obviously. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but I and I actually have I I've taught. Uh, a class at Johns Hopkins a couple times on that, uh, made that whole subject, the, the Russian attack on the election into a class um, that I've taught a couple times at Hopkins. Um, and I wrote a lot of stories about it that you can Google. But um, yeah, I mean, I think what it was, in a, you know, to say something very <laughs> different, was a, uh, you know, sort of a, a test of um, how an, an attack on election uh, could operate in the era of cyberspace. The, the Russians and the Soviets before them um, had tried to tamper with American elections, but if all you had was newspapers, it was tough. The famous example in Soviet times was um, the, the KGB placed a fake story in an Indian newspaper that said that the AIDS virus had been concocted at the US Army's biological lab at Fort Detrick, Maryland. And that one really took off and went all around the world. And you can still, every once in a while, pops up somewhere that some, you know, someone will say, well, you know, uh, you know, HIV came from a, a, an American lab, a military lab. Uh, there's nothing to it, but um, that was successful. But really having these tools um, were, was much more effective, both the hacking and the leaking and the manipulation of social media. I mean, one of the things that's so interesting about that is uh, something I often think about is just as the Al Qaeda hijackers used American tools to mount their attacks, they needed to have, you know, um, airliners loaded with fuel for a cross country trip um, and a very well developed, you know, transcontinental uh, air, tra air system. Um, in order to attack the buildings in um, in New York and Washington. Um, similarly, the Russians used Google, Facebook, Twitter. Um, you know, they um, they turned American tools uh, against the American election. So it's it's an amazing case study. And I have to say, I, I hand it to the Russians when I teach this. Um, you know, there's no way of proving it, but when I teach it, I, uh, I often say that while you cannot prove it, my, my belief is that the race in 2016 was close enough and the Russian, uh, especially the hacking and leaking, 
through WikiLeaks was effective enough that um, if uh, if Putin had decided he wanted Clinton to be president, she would would have become president. And because he decided he wanted Trump to be president, Trump became president, which is a very disturbing conclusion to reach. But yeah, anyway, sure. I don't want to get off on that <laughs> too far. <down. laughs> Thank you for that, though. Sure, you bet. We won't let you get off on that. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. But he's, these are, we're all members, some of us in the group. And one of the things we were talking about was do you think he's going to talk about her? Can we ask him? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no, I mean, there's a lot of things I'm sure we could talk about, but there's here's another question. Have you found much information on Smallwood in Toronto? I actually did find a good bit, and I found a local historian there who, to my amazement, recognized the name Thomas Smallwood. So those of you who haven't read the book, spoiler alert, um, but he ends up in Canada in Toronto and spends the rest of his life in Toronto. So um, I did manage to find uh, a, a significant amount about his life up there. And, uh, um, but I, I would love to find more, you know, the whole time I was writing this book, I dreamed of, you know, finding a descendant, finding a museum, finding something where, the, they, where there was a trunk of documents that included, you know, Thomas Smallwood's journals, and Thomas Smallwood's correspondence. And um, unfortunately, I'm still looking. Uh, but the Canadian angle is is really an interesting one. And of course, that was the British Empire then. And Smallwood in the 1840s always advised people to keep on going to uh, Canada. That was a controversial view. There were arguments about it. Some abolitionists wanted people to stop on U.S. soil so they could kind of join the, join the fight and, um, you, you know, battle slavery. Um, However, I was amazed that slave catchers, slave catching police officers from Baltimore, Maryland, uh, were going as far north as Albany uh, to try to drag people back down into slavery. So you could get as far as Albany, New York, uh, which is pretty far, and not be safe from the slave catchers, uh, let alone the bounty hunters who would sometimes kidnap free people and drag themselves and sell them into slavery. So. Um, so he insisted on going to, you know, he insisted that it was smart to go to Canada. And when the Second Fugitive Slave Act was passed in 1850, which basically told Northerners that they had to help return anyone who uh, had escaped slavery to the South, to their enslaver, um, you know, he basically said, told you so. Uh, so uh, so, you know, the Canadian angle on this story is a pretty interesting one. Thank you, anybody Scott. <clears throat> if no, does anybody have any other questions? There's Otherwise, questions. we should let him go. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, listen, thanks, everybody. Appreciate Thank the you. questions. Really appreciate your coming Thank tonight. You. Uh, and, and those of you who haven't read the book, hope you enjoy it. Well, I have to tell you, we all enjoyed the book, mightily, those of us who read it. And this has been such a wonderful treat to have you. Thank you very much. And, Thank you. Um, Thank we you. will look for your next um, your okay. next writings, okay? All right. I appreciate it. Take care now. Thank you Thank so you. much. So generous. Okay. Thank okay. you. So bye. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye.